<laughs> We're waiting for Frank. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. You have to take the gifts God gives you. <laughs> And maybe you've been bad, and that's why you got this gift. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, we are sort of at what I call the in-between Sunday, when we move from Thanksgiving to Christmas. And uh, it's, it's a good transition, but if you aren't careful, you can sort of uh, get off track. Uh, because it, the Christmas season really and rightly begins with Thanksgiving. Now I realize uh, Thanksgiving isn't a, a national holiday in Scripture. But all through Scripture, we are urged to be thankful people. Now what can happen to us if we aren't careful is, we move from thinking about being thankful people to thinking about being crazy people as we move into the Christmas season and it, it, it can become all about what we can get and all about what we can spend and all about what we can buy and we can forget about being thankful for what we have and about being thankful for what God has given us. We had a little saying on our sign for a while. Can you get rid of that echo please? Mike, can you help us? Um, we, we used to have a, a, a saying on our sign for a little while and it said the best things in life aren't things. Isn't that the truth? You know? And we need to remember that but in, in all the commercialism and the hubbub of Christmas we can sometimes forget. One of the most important times that we speak with someone is when we are passing the torch. You know, when, when we are ready to move on and we want to say something to our kids or our grandkids or whatever that they will remember us. And, and so it had always been. And when King David was at the end of his life and he was going to hand the torch to his son Solomon, there were many things that he could have said to him. But here's what he chose to say, and it's, it's in 1 Chronicles, the 29th chapter, and I'm just going to start in the 11th verse. He's telling Solomon to remember these things. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. So in David's final words to his son, he is reminding him that everything he has or will have comes from God and to remain thankful for that. And then if you know the story of Solomon, he got off track down the line. He forgot to be thankful to God for all he had. Recognizing that all we have comes from God is key to being thankful people. Now you may say, well wait a minute, I worked really hard for what I have. I, I spent lots of 12-hour days in the office, uh, working uh, late, uh, trying to, to put this thing together, and now I've achieved success. Well, that's good. But where did you get the health to allow you to do that? Where did you get the intelligence to allow you to do that? Where did you get the talent to rise to the top in, in a certain field? It all came from God. Now, what we do with it uh, is up to us sometimes, but where it comes from is from God. So I would encourage you as we move towards Christmas to just think about what you have, or what you know, what, who you are, and remember that that comes from God. Always being thankful. But you say, well these are hard times, Pastor. You don't understand. 
uh, we've, we've just been through or still are in a recession. Uh, times are hard. Pastor, you don't understand. I was at the doctor the other day and he told me that it's cancer. You know, Pastor, you don't understand. My, my child is, is running amok and there doesn't seem to be anything I can do about it. And we could go on and on with the list. But the fact of the matter is, we always live in hard times. It's a fallen world. And someone is always going through a hard time. We think back to the first Thanksgiving, 1621. And we have the pilgrims, and they came here, and they'd been here a year, and they're going to now celebrate their first Thanksgiving. But think about this. It was a hard time. By all indicators, it shouldn't be a happy time. A year before, 102 people established their little colony. There were 42 left. Over half of them had died. Now, the women are going to cook the turkey. Right? Out of 18 women that came, there were four left alive. Now, in that circumstance, they came together and they said, we're going to give thanks to our God. And they did. Isn't that amazing? In the midst of times like that. Well, Thanksgiving didn't become a holiday until 1863. Lincoln was the president. Now there had been Thanksgiving proclamations. George Washington gave one and some of the other presidents along the way had issued proclamations for a day of Thanksgiving. But Abraham Lincoln is the one that made it a national holiday in 1863. Now why is 1863 important? 1863 was a hard time. The armies of the North we're losing. And it looked like they were going to lose. Uh, Lincoln was having, taking all kinds of flack. And in the midst of that, he declares a day of thanksgiving. In everything, give thanks. In uh, 1 Thessalonians, 518. Paul says it like this. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. The New Living Translation says it this way. No matter what happens, Always be thankful, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ. So no matter what happens, and in all circumstances, be thankful. Now you say, well, that's hard to do. I agree. Yeah, it's hard for me. It's very difficult for me. I'm, I'm a self-centered, selfish person. So I have to be reminded all the time to be thankful for the things God has given me when things don't go my way. It's easy to be thankful when it's going your way until we forget why it's going our way. So this morning I just want to remind us of four gifts God has given us that we can always be thankful for regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what is happening in our lives at any given moment. And I'm going to start with the greatest gift of all and that is the gift of grace. God has given us the gift of grace. What is grace? Grace is what saves us. Grace is what draws us to Christ. Grace is what brings us into God's kingdom. Grace is everything God does for you, but most importantly, grace is what God did for you that you could never have done for yourself. That's the most important gift 
you've ever received and that's the gift of faith in Jesus Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul tells us of our condition before grace. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. We were spiritually dead. Now what can a dead person do to improve their position? Nothing. Nothing. You could not respond to the gospel. I don't care how many times you heard it. It was just so much falderaw to you. Because you were spiritually what? Dead. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But God. Isn't that a great little phrase? And we see it so many times in the scripture when uh, God is describing some horrible circumstance that Israel had found itself in or that uh, the Christians in the New Testament find themselves in and it seems impossibly, it seems, it seems hopeless and we read that little phrase, but God. So you were dead. I was dead. Paul told, describes it as we were enemies of God. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice the tenses. Not that he will raise us up with him, not that he will seat us with him, but in eternal time we're already there. We're already raised up. We're already seated with Christ. That's our position. That's the position we hold by His grace. Now maybe the circumstances you're in at the moment may seem to conflict with that statement. But they do not. You are already there. By His grace you've been made spiritually alive. And then His Holy Spirit begins to woo you, begins to draw you. That's why you can come and you can hear the gospel over and over and over again. And it falls pretty much on deaf ears. And then you hear it one more time. And you say, wow, I get it. Because the Holy Spirit has begun to draw you. The theological term for that is irresistible grace. In other words, you will come. It just may take a little longer for some than for others. I like to, to use the example, and you've heard me use it in the past, of Paul and Timothy and how they came to know the Lord. And you remember what, what Paul, he, he was... Uh, <clears throat> an enemy of the gospel. He hated Jesus Christ. He hated the name. And what was his position? He was a, the high inquisitor, so to speak. And he was going from town to town imprisoning Christians. Having them beaten. Having them killed. And he's on his way to another town to rid it of this scourge called Christianity. And what happens? You know the story lightning bolt, whatever comes out of heaven, knocks him off his horse, and God says to him, Paul, Paul, why persecute me? And his eyes were opened, and he became a Christian. Now some of you may have had an experience similar to that, and that's tremendous. But then you have the Timothys of this world. And what does Paul say about Timothy? He just simply says, you were always a Christian because of your grandmother's witness to you. He just sort of always believed in Christ. Now you can come to Christ through either of those two extremes or anywhere in the middle. Because the Holy Spirit does what is necessary to bring us into the kingdom. For some of us are like Paul. We have to be knocked off our horse and beat up a little bit before we come in. Some of us are a little smarter. We're like Timothy and we just kind of always believe and always know that Jesus is there and, and that's great. But either way, it's the result of God's grace. 
and his Holy Spirit wooing us into his kingdom. Again, David, I think, is helpful uh, in the 103rd Psalm. And uh, this is a, a beautiful piece of scripture. It's a, it's a little bit long, uh, but I, I think you can endure it here. Uh, j just listen to this. Psalm 103, uh, verses 2 through 11. David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all our iniquity and heals all our diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. That's good news. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. That's so cool. Just think, if that weren't true, what if he dealt with us according to our deeds? He'd wipe us all out. We'd be done. He'd start with me. But he doesn't. Because of his love and his grace. He forgives. He ransoms. He surrounds us with his love. He renews. He shows mercy. We had no hope. We're headed for hell. Not heaven. And there was nothing we could do about it. Nothing we could do about it. You know, for the last 20 years probably or so, uh, the, the word seekers was kind of the big thing in Christianity. Uh, we're we're going to have a seeker service. We're going to set up a seeker church. Uh, well, how many seekers of God are there, according to Scripture? None. Not even one. Read Romans. Paul lays it out. None. There's none that seek us after God. Now people are seeking to have their problems solved. They're seeking to have their needs met. They're seeking for all kinds of things. But they're not seeking God. Until the Holy Spirit woos them and draws them in. But God says, I'm just going to give you the gift of grace. One more question I want to ask you about grace before we move on. God has extended the gift of grace to you. Ask yourself the question, why me? I've asked that question a thousand times. Why me? Out of all the people I could think of that were better, nicer, smarter, keener, more spiritual, whatever than I am, yet God reached out to me. I don't get it. That's God's business. But so our response to that is, let's just be thankful that he did. Because he had so many other choices. I would not have chosen me. Unless you think I'm so bad and you're so good, I probably wouldn't have chosen you either. <laughs> so there. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, God did. He chose us based solely on his love not on our merit. So the gift of grace we can always be thankful for. We can be thankful for the gift of a plan for our life. God has a plan for our lives. Your life is no accident. It wasn't just some chance thing that went on. No matter how you were conceived, whether you were a planned pregnancy or an unplanned pregnancy, or what it was, you were planned by God. And he has a plan for the rest of your life. Read Psalm 139 sometime if you think you were an accident of birth. It's a great psalm. It talks about how God knew you before he even formed you in the womb. Knew everything about you. Knew what you were going to do. What you were going to become. 
God made you for a reason. You have a purpose. You have a divine purpose. God has a plan for your life. You know Jeremiah 29 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to do you good, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. See, we, we struggle. We need to know that, that God's plans for us are to do us good, not to do us harm. And yet sometimes, in order to get us to that place where we can receive the good, he has to come down on us a little bit. And we don't like that part of the plan. The problem is, you see, we often have our own plans. I have some great plans for my life. If God would just listen, you know, man. But what we have to understand is, we don't have all the information. So what we think may be a great plan based on what we know could be a disaster. You see. Because we don't know all the details, but God does. We must understand God's plan is always immeasurably better than our plan. Now our plan, granted, is usually more touchy-feely. <laughs> and you know, uh, has a few more perks maybe, we think. But God's plan is better than our plan. God's plan is to mature us in Christ and make us servants of all. Now sometimes this is an uncomfortable experience for us. But if you think about it, most everything you have ever achieved in your life came at the end of going through some uncomfortable things to get there. If you went to school, and if you were successful in school, you went through some uncomfortable times of studying into the night, of taking tests that you didn't really enjoy taking, and all of those things, but they eventually culminated in a degree, or in at least some greater knowledge than you had. We can be thankful that God has a plan. I like the way Isaiah puts it in chapter 43, in verse 1, or verse 2. Well, start, we'll start in the middle of verse 1. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. Okay, that's settled, right? He's done all that, we're his. Everything should be peachy now, right? No more problems. But then look what he says. Not if, but when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned up, and the flame shall not consume you. Well, what's he telling us? We're going to go through some turbulent waters. We're going to walk through some fire. But the good news is, we're not going to drown. We're not going to be burned up. We may be singed a little bit, we may gulp down a little bit of water, but He has redeemed us. We can be thankful. It's going to be okay. Robert Schuler used to have a saying, God never wastes a hurt. And that's good to know. Because most of us have been hurt somewhere along the way. If you haven't, hang on, you will. Why does God allow that? Because you are then equipped to minister to someone else who is hurting and going through that same thing. You see? Because hurts make us sensitive. Hurts make us compassionate. Hurts allow us to see the other person going through what we went through and allow us to draw alongside and help them. Knowing these things allow us to do as God commands in Thessalonians, to always be thankful. You see, my attitude does not depend on circumstances. And boy, that was a hard one for me to learn. 
I used to let circumstances govern my attitude. Don't do that. It's immature. Let your attitude govern circumstances. Someone put it this way, and I like this little saying. And it's pretty good. It says, when you enter a room, and I certainly haven't mastered this yet, but I'm working on it. When you enter a room, be a thermostat, not a thermometer. Okay? Especially in your attitude. Because think about it now, what does a thermostat do? It controls the temperature. It warms the room when it needs to be warmed. It cools it when it needs to be cooled. So affect others, affect the temperature in the rooms you enter. What does a thermometer do? Basically nothing. It sits there and tells you it's too hot or it's too cold. So be the thermostat. Don't be the thermometer. God has given me the gift of grace. God has given me the gift of having a divine plan for my life. Now God has given me a home in heaven. How about that? First, or 2 Corinthians 5.1 Paul says, For we know, again the positive, we know that if the tent that is our healthy earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And believe me, as I continue along my journey, my house gets more and more rickety as the days go by. And I discover that it is falling apart in some places. And, but I, ha I know that it doesn't matter because even if it falls apart completely, I just step into my heavenly home. And it's all good. Originally, you see, you were designed to live forever. You realize that, don't you? The human body, the human being, was designed to live forever. And if Adam would not have succumbed, we would live forever. But because of the fall, we have lost that ability. But one day, your body is going to die, but that is not the end of you. Because the Bible says we are created in God's image, and that means that we have a soul. This body isn't all we have. We have the image of God, the Imago Dei, stamped upon us. And this is great news, because it means we don't have to be afraid of anything here on earth. Someone has said, you're not ready to live until you are ready to die. Okay? You can't fully live until you're ready to die. There's a country western song. I know you all love my country western yeah, analogies, especially Jim. Where are you at, Jim? Yeah, this is for you. Yeah. Yeah, Jim loves western music. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there's a Western song that was popular, I don't know, a year or two ago, you know, and it says, I wish you could live like you were dying. And the thing is, this guy gets a diagnosis that he's going to die, and so he goes out and finally does all the stuff he wanted to do and becomes the guy he wanted to be, becomes the kind of friend he wanted to become, and all those things. And so then his refrain is, I wish that you could live like you were dying. But as Christians, we can. Because as our friend Bonhoeffer said about death, for me this is the end, the beginning of life. Because Bonhoeffer knew when that gallows drawer, door dropped out from under him, it was the end of his physical life, but the beginning of eternal life with Christ in his heavenly home. And I'm sure if we could talk to him today, and we will be able to talk to him someday, he would tell us he has no regrets. You're not ready to live until you are ready to die. Only a fool would go through life totally unprepared for something that you know is inevitable. Science backs me up on this. I, I did a, a, a lot of extensive uh, investigation and searching into this thing. And here's what I discovered, and, and science will corroborate this. The mortality rate 
among human beings is 100%. <laughs> so there you go. Now it'd be foolish not to prepare for something that is inevitable. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, now is the time to correct that because one of these days you're going to step into eternity. It's guaranteed. And you'll either be eternally with Christ or eternally without Christ. And I can't imagine how bad it would be to be eternally without Christ. So God has given me the gift of grace. God has given me the gift of a plan. God has given me the gift of an eternal home in heaven. And now God has, is making changes in me. And sometimes we don't see that as a gift. But believe me, it is. I am so glad that I am not the person I used to be. I'm so glad I'm not the person I used to be. And no matter how good or bad you were on a human level, if you know Jesus Christ and you, you have seen your sin, you can make that same statement with me. You are so glad you aren't the person you used to be. You know, one thing I've noticed about Christians, the ones that I like to call the, the dear old saints that have walked with the Lord for years and they've, they, they know their Bibles, they, they really know God, and they're close to God. And if you talk to those people, they will be the first to tell you they are the most vile sinners. And it's almost contradictory. You say, well, how can that be? I look at your life and, and you're doing everything like I would like to be doing it. You know God's word. You're, you're a prayer warrior. You're all these things. Well, here's how they can say that. And, and they're not being morbid at all. They're being honest. It, it's the old thing, the closer you are to the light, the more the flaws are revealed. You see. And that's what they're saying. You talk to some of those people that you see as spiritual giants, and if you can, you can talk to them on a personal level, you'll find out that they understand what vile sinners they were, and therefore they appreciate God's gift of grace so much more than those who don't understand. Not only am I glad I'm not the person I used to be, I'm glad I am not the person I will be. Or I'm glad I'm becoming the person I will be. You see? And so it is with you. You are not who you used to be. And you aren't yet who you are going to become. And that's good news too. God looks at us and he says, I see that lump of clay or I see that piece of junk or however you want to phrase it. And he says, I can do something with that. I can make something out of that. I have a plan for that lump. And then he begins to mold us and make us. And what is it that he's making us into? He's making us into the image of Christ. We, you know, Paul tells us you know, in Romans 8.29 that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to become. Now that job won't be fully completed until we step into eternity, but we're going to become more and more like him as we walk down the road of life with him. Well, God says his plan for me is to make me like Jesus. How cool is that? You're going to be like Jesus. Look in the mirror and check out what you see. And you can say to that person you see in the mirror, you are becoming like Jesus. Now, it may not look like it, because some of you don't look very good in the mirror. But you are becoming like Jesus. Little by little, more and more, every day. 
So God has given me the gift of grace. He's given me the plan. He's given me a home. He's giving me the changes that he's making in my life. These are all things we can be thankful for in all circumstances. But thankfulness, like love, must be expressed. You know, you've all heard the old story about the, the couple that had been married for 50 years and uh, the guy had, ever since the ceremony, had never told his wife he loved her. And so one day she asked him, she says, Otis, in all these 50 years we've been married, you've never told me you love me. And he looked at her and he says, well, I told you I loved you at the ceremony and when I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> That's okay, but God wants a little more out of us than that. He wants us to express his love through our thankfulness. So how do we do that? Last, last point. How do you say thank you to God? Three ways. By serving him. Okay? By serving him. Paul in Romans I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices. That's how one way we say thank you to God. When we serve God by serving people, it is never a chore, it's a privilege. If you're just serving people, it can become a chore, but if you're serving God by serving people, it's always a privilege. Number two, by giving generously. In Acts 20, 35, the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when we talk about giving generously, you say, uh-oh, he's getting in my wallet. Well, okay, I like that. No, we are talking about your finances, but we're talking about your entire life. We're talking about the giving of yourself, the giving of your time, the giving of your talents. No, those sorts of things. The, the whole life thing. It's an attitude of giving. And we demonstrate our thankfulness to him by telling others about him. See? We'll sing that song, I'm sure, uh, during the Christmas season somewhere, Go Tell It on the Mountain. You know, what, what, what it's saying is just go tell anybody and everybody that will listen about Jesus. So in preparation for Christmas and in appreciation for Thanksgiving, how about doing a serving, giving, telling checkup? Do a serving, giving, telling checkup. Now you can only do this checkup on yourselves. It's always tempting to look over at somebody else. But this is a personal checkup. Just ask yourself, between you and God, nobody else, how am I doing? And hopefully you'll, you'll be able to say, you know what, I'm doing pretty darn good. I'm going to try to do better. I know I can always do better. But I'm doing pretty good. I think I'm, I'm serving God. I think I'm giving to God. It, you know, I, I think I'm sharing God. And that, that's huge. That's tremendous. And if not, ask Him to help you. Do a little better. But in all things, give thanks. For this is the will of God for your life. You know, oftentimes people say, what's the will of God for my life? Well, there you have it. Always be thankful. For this is the will of God in your life. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much for these four gifts and so many more wonderful things you give us. But Lord, we, we just most of all want to remember that you have given us the gift of eternal life through no merit of our own strictly by your grace and your love. And therefore, we should be humbled. We should be excited about telling others about you, especially this time of year. And Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, I would just pray that your Holy Spirit right now would tweak their hearts and that they would respond to that tweak and say, just in the quietness of their heart, yes, Lord, I want you as my Savior. And then, Lord, for the first time, they will be able to truly experience the joy of Christmas. We ask all these things in your precious name, Jesus.
Amen.